So you're going to be spending a lot of time in your career writing, thinking about publishing, publishing, and reflecting back on what you do. People will keep asking you the same question. And they do that every single day. My neighbor actually comes and talks to me a little bit. She's not academic. She said, so what are you working on? And then I tell her what I'm working on. She said, so why is that important? Why is that interesting? Then I have to motivate kind of the conversation. Actually, one of, the, one of my friends is married to a flight attendant, Delta flight attendant. I see her like three times a year. That's the first thing. So what's your paper about, correct? What are you working on? Okay, and, and honestly, she would grill me. She does not mean to grill me. She wants to understand why I would waste my time doing stuff like that. So when you apply for a job, we look at your resume, we know where you went to school and so on, say, so what is he or she working on? Okay, and where does this fit into the bigger conversation in the field? And then the next question we ask, of course, is this person capable of making a dent in the literature, adding some substantially to our definition of what the field is all about. So that's the kind of thing that you will be dealing with. How to choose an interesting research question to focus on. Just gonna tell you a couple of things before I get into my talk, okay? One, do the things you like. Two, do the things you like as long as you connect them to what the field is all about. You have to be very clever not only in choosing the questions, but communicating the connection between your work to the field. Why should I care about reading your paper? That is the question that you really need to answer. What's interesting about it? So we all get journals all the time. You look into the literature. Some of you even you know, cruise the internet looking for publications and said, this is a really interesting question. Well, well, I never thought about it. The problem with interesting question is that they're almost never interesting beforehand. When they are done, when, when they're clearer, they become kind of important in terms of their own significance, in terms of their own stuff. So those two things that I will be talking about. Do the things that you like, connect what you're doing to the rest of the conversation in the field. And that's really, 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 really a tremendous uh, challenge, that connection to the field. And that's why it is important for you to work with co-authors, for you to debate things, uh, to, to you know, test your ideas with other people. Uh, talking to senior faculty members who have been at the profession for a while, you know, to, to give you kind of the uh, intellectual uh, ammunition to say why this question really matters, okay? So it doesn't really matter what you work on, ultimately, as long as it is relevant to the field. So let me uh, step uh, into my conversation. I think we all know what an interesting question is all about, okay? It's usually simple, intuitive kind of, wow, this is really interesting. We, we know it uh, when we see it, but the problem is, of course, we don't know how you come up with that. Uh, it, it makes us challenge what we know. It can lead us to different results in terms of what the results mean. For example, one of the best questions that have been around for like 500 years, does entrepreneurship education matter? They were asking that question before I even went to graduate school. And the answer, of course, changes over a period of time. We have accumulating evidence. But why the question is interesting, it's not the kind of question I would ask, but it does have political, uh, um, policy implications, has teaching education implications, it has research implications. A good research question will make you think about how the relationships between different variables uh, kind of evolve and what are the mechanisms that connect them. And that's what the field is all about. Writing theory is about explicating mechanisms. Why A affects B and in what way and to what extent. So that's basically one of the, the key foundations of a good research question. It offers a new view of the field. Uh, the big debate that some a few years ago erupted between creation versus discovery. And some of you probably have seen that. You probably have read some of these articles. And you know, I initially I was like taking, who cares? You know what I mean? But actually, once the debate takes place, you cannot see the field in any way different from that. You can understand that there are opportunities that you discover, there are opportunities that are created, and then, of course, there are, they can also lead to a virtuous cycle. It can open a different research question, a line of inquiry. Uh, that, that's something that you really un you understand. Do, or, I mean, there is a lot of work that's been done on social entrepreneurship, okay? That's a kind of... Um, a subfield that has grown quite a bit. There are some fundamental issues in that area. Again, and there are hundreds of people who are now studying those different types of questions. So, if not all research questions are alike. This is Will Mitchell, um, 
kind of definition. He talks about there are three broad sets of questions that we all think about. I'm just going to cheat a little bit here. I'll have to look at the slides. Uh, one is the blue type, with the two blue types. These are questions that address a gap in existing theory using new empirical data to help complete and extend our arguments. For example, the debate that I have just mentioned about discovery and creation. It would be nice if somebody has a big database and we can figure out when we have creation versus discovery and what are the consequences of that. That would be the kind of research that has been, that is, falls under this umbrella. And a lot of the work in the field is all about this. We have kind of an argument in theory, then we go on to find empirical results, uh, data, and try to test them. And try, I, I think we spend a lot of time. Graduate school, I think, focus a lot on that. The next uh, type is the red, uh, red uh, research question. It addresses empirical questions or puzzles using concepts from more un, uh, traditional theories to frame how to study those issues. A lot of the work, for example, that has been imported from psychology to study why entrepreneurs make decisions or study cognition, um, uh, uh, entrepreneurial cognition or entrepreneurial learning, all of these will fall under this kind of uh, uh, research question. The green one addresses important empirical questions and use answers to create new theory. So it gives back. So you have an empirical question that have, we have a lot of questions like um, sample selection bias. And we, once we correct for sample selection bias, we can look into, for example, the career choices that entrepreneurs make. In economics, they use quite a bit about employee mobility, for example. Again, we can look into the data to provide insights into the kind of theoretical reasons behind employee mobilities and the consequences of that mobility. Again, we, we, you don't have to classify into all of these types, but the idea there is, you know, not all research questions are alike. All of them have different roles to, uh, to play in kind of developing the field and our theoretical foundations. So as I mentioned, a good interesting research question should interest you, that's the most important one, and interest others. Let's look and play around with this little bit. Okay, let's assume that we can two by two matrix. You have been here for almost 10 minutes now listening. So you you have to have a two by two matrix. So imagine, okay, so you can, you're interested versus not interested. Others are interested in what you have to say or not interested. So to look into this combination. If you are interested and nobody else is interested, that's, you're, you're spending your time doing the things you like. That's your hobby, correct? It's not gonna sell very well. You have to learn to communicate. Honestly, this is the, one of the biggest uh, bottlenecks early on in people getting published. They know what they have done, they do it well, good empirical work, but they don't communicate or do not know how to communicate the argument that they are making or why it matters for the field. That's, that's one of the biggest, biggest challenges. The second thing, if you are not interested and others are interested, and, and you see that, that is far more, more common. I, I ran into people, I said, uh, so what are you working on? I'm doing four or five papers on entrepreneurial orientation, okay? I have nothing with entrepreneurial orientation. I think uh, some of my early work was among the first in that area, and then I dropped it and moved on. So, but anyway, so why are you doing? It says, well, you know, I really, really not excited about it, but a lot of people publish that. I see all of the journals publishing in this. But why are you doing it? He said, yeah, it's, you have the data, I have this. So this is like the kind of job. So you want to get a couple of publications. It doesn't work. You might get the publications, but you're not going to get the recognition. You're not going to make the impact that you will need in the field. OK, the next one, if you are not interested in that issue, or you are not, and nobody else is interested, so the question, you're wasting your time. What are you thinking about? You need to be waste your time or spend your time much more interesting. And, and you know, uh, there are people who are, you know, um, earlier in my career, <clears throat> it really uh, was really puzzling to me. I'm not gonna mention the person because he's very active in, in the field, actually has done well. But for the first 10 years of his life, his career, really he was like an orphan. Why? He was thinking about entrepreneurial cognition. He comes from psychology. And nobody was interested at the time in, in, in that. Now everybody seems to be interested, but it, it took him a while. And he said, that's the only thing from psychology that I can bring into entrepreneurship, yeah, which is not true. So he was really not, his heart was not in it, but he thought he can make a difference and people were not interested. So let me pause here for a second and ask you a question. What will be four or five big debates that are taking place in the field? Why does entrepreneurship matter, for example? 
the entrepreneurship, why are we studying all of these things? What are the different types of entrepreneurial activities and what are their uh, f social consequences? That's why economists and sociologists are having tremendous influence now in terms of shaping public policy about entrepreneurship because they ask those broader questions when in fact we are asking more at the individual kind of level question. So the big thing, the big challenge for you, for you then is to how to move from taking a question that is a hobby, something that you're interested in and make it part of the bigger conversation by getting others interested in. The same thing with, with uh, being a question that's almost like a job you don't care about. And the answer is pretty clear. You need to uh, read about the debates. You need to um, actually uh, converse with people who are doing this work. You need to talk to senior people and get their insights about what, what you know what you're trying to do. Test your ideas. Talk to them. Get some feedback. And again, you have to be careful. You have to be intelligent because all of us bring our blind spots into these kind of converse, conversations. So uh, I, sometimes you have to look into the data and let the data speak to you. Sometimes the data will suggest a lot of different ideas that you actually look into um, as a potential way of building your own argument. Okay, where do we get all of these interesting, interesting questions? Obviously your intuition, your experience, your insight, but there is no substitute for your immersion in the phenomenon, being close to the site, talking to people who are active in the, in the field, and actually reading the original works, thinking about the debates and questioning their assumptions, you really need to do a little bit of that second order thinking to be, make sure that you find your own way into the good, the good question. Uh, there is no way I can tell you this is a research question before the hand, beforehand. I think most of the interesting questions, uh, the, not all of them at least, you know, you know him once you see him. I remember a few years ago, one of the editors of AMR was talking about papers in AMR. He said one of the biggest complaints that he used to get is that people say, these papers are simple. They're so obvious. He said, yes, they're obvious after the fact. Again, many of the questions that we do sometimes look that way, easy and simple and interesting, after you have spent a lot of time shaping them, chiseling them to make, to craft them into an interesting research questions. Um, when I was a doctoral student, I went through the consortium. Shaker was running the doctoral consortium that year and did an excellent job. And I went through with Denny Gregoire, who's speaking in the next session, and Jerry George was the person who uh, reviewed my paper and uh, really bashed the paper. I was so excited because it was my first submission to the Academy, and it, I was, it got into the best paper proceedings, and I was so excited. And Jerry told me how it was unpublishable. And, um, I was, I was depressed for a couple of years. Jerry always says he doesn't remember the story, but, um, <laughs> but he was right. He was right. Uh, and I learned from it and uh, kind of converted it to an empirical paper and, and did eventually publish uh, certain components of it. So I just have a, 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 a few slides uh, to run through and then leave the rest uh, open for discussion here. First, Acker said, people come up to his door, ask, what are you working on? So it's important that you have interesting things, but it's most important that you can say you're working on something. And if you're working on something, then you're already ahead of the game. And if you keep working on something, and even better is if they ask you, what have you published recently? Because there's some people you ask what they're working on, and they always have interesting answers. But they're always working on the same project and never actually executing on it and getting it done. So getting stuff done and being pragmatic is as important as it is to do interesting research. So that's what I'm going to focus on here is kind of a, a high-level pragmatic perspective of, of doing interesting work. So you can't see the colors very well here. So Shacker gave you a two-by-two, two and I'm now giving you a Venn diagram. So we've checked all the boxes for this session now. On it. So first is obviously it needs to be novel, right? So you want it to be original but not too original with what you come up with. Have any of you seen this uh, YouTube video called Everything is a Remix? And there's a book that kind of coincides with it called uh, Steal Like an Artist. And how most people, when they become experts in the field, they spend their developmental stages copying other people. All musicians do this. Authors often do it. Great writers copy other authors first. And then they transform and recombine things. Everything is some recombination of what's already out there and existing. And it's a really simple way to look at creativity. Um, and it's a good way to start and, and not worry. It's, it's, uh, 
you know, when, when, when somebody uh, gets up in front of you and says, well, interesting work, you just, you know it when you see it. Well, that's difficult as a doctoral student. It's, it's true and you'll get there eventually, um, but it's a little frightening kind of to hear that you'll never know it until a, until a, uh, a reviewer or an editor tells you whether it's interesting or, or, or not. Um, so you need to do something that's novel, but um, you can't deviate usually too far. People will only let you stretch kind of so far. You can't have like every variable in your model being original. You still have to have components that people are used to and try to deviate from there. Uh, there are different techniques. I often play devil's advocate in my research and kind of take a counterintuitive perspective. So if you look at what do we know and then say, well, in what cases does that really hold true? Um, is, is a good way to look at it as well. Now, you may be able to really want to start from scratch on something that's very different from what's been done. In such case, you really should start with a theoretical, strong theoretical ground and start with a theoretical paper or qualitative. I review lots of papers where they say, this is, this is groundbreaking new, a, new area of research, and then they follow this uh, huge like data mining exercise for the methods, which just isn't a methodological fit to start with. Um, by doing that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you can start from the beginning, but you really need to start with a theoretically grounded perspective to do that. You need to create new theory first. So popularity, somebody has to be interested in the work, right? You have to have conversance, like Shocker said this as well. Um, you need to work with established theory and hopefully extend. But you can, you can start and try to do something that's uh, not very popular. It's kind of like when you uh, release a new product and it's a uh, radical innovation and there's not really a need, it's pushed out there. You have, to, you have to build up why people need this new product. You have to do the same with this. And then you have to build up comp complementary products that go around it. So you may have to build a community from scratch yourself. People have done this. Saris did this with effectuation and doing special issue conferences, a textbook on effectuation, all the pieces that kind of bring together help to develop a community. Then finally, it's obviously helpful if it's measurable. Um, if there are established measures, great. That's a, a big head start. Importantly, can you gain access to relevant samples? Um, can you gain uh, meaningful performance data? And more and more important now, if you want to publish in top journals, is you need to be able to collect repeated measures. Um, which is very difficult in entrepreneurship. It's easy if you go into a large company and get access to do repeated measures, but very difficult when you're sampling entrepreneurs and try to get them to fill out multiple things, with, unless you're using a convenient sample. Um, but again, there are obviously routes you can take, and you can create new measures, you can create new tools and so forth um, online, but just know it's going to be much more challenging for you, and it's not as certain what the outcome will be. So quickly, a couple of traps. This is from kind of based on another book I like. If, has anybody here read the book called uh, Monk and the Riddle by Randy Komisar? He talks about the deferred life plan, and everybody says, uh, I'm just going to work now so that I can kind of save up money and do what I want later. And usually people don't get there. And so often you hear people in academia say, I'm going to do what research I need to get done to get published at the journals that will get me tenure, and then I will get to the research that's really interesting to me and what I want to do. I've never seen that ever happen. People tend to do the same stuff later on that they do early on. I don't know, Shaq or Jerry, you guys have been around long. I don't know, have you ever seen anybody really convert over and all of a sudden after tenure do really interesting research where they didn't earlier? Maybe rarely. It's just I haven't seen it very frequently. So what you do now really shapes where you're going to end up in the future. And Sometimes it's worth taking a chance and maybe not getting tenure at the first school that you're, you're at. But as long as you keep working hard, you'll, you'll get there and you'll have, you'll have an office somewhere um, and a job somewhere, hopefully. Saying yes to too many projects, it's, uh, it's attractive. Um, and you'll get more and more opportunities as you get more senior and get more done. They get on different projects. But it's really important to stay focused. It's easier to do interesting research if you really know an area inside and out and you really try to stay focused within that area. Some people might have two streams or so forth. But don't just say yes and, uh, to anything that pops up just because you think there might be a good chance for it to, uh, to get published. It's really easy to always be working on someone else's project that you got invited on and you feel the responsibility that you don't want to fall behind on that while easily letting your own work um, fall to the wayside. There's lots of people I see who use a single method as a hammer, per se, like the meta-analysis people who will just 
do meta-analysis on whatever topic seems popular at the moment. Um, I reviewed this last year, a paper that was a meta-analysis on a research topic of which there had never been a study on. Um, but they came up with just all these weird proxies, but it's just what this team of researchers did. They just found whatever they thought was hot or what was interesting in their minds and did a meta-analysis. It makes a lot of sense to do a meta-analysis in, in an area that you're an expert in and it fits, but to just jump all over the place, you'll never create an identity and it's not very interesting to me just to apply the same method all the time, but um, if you are interested from a methodological standpoint, then you've got to try to do something interesting and different from that perspective. Don't only read the entrepreneurship literature. Most of the interesting things that pique my curiosity come from psychology and have applications to, to entrepreneurship. Uh, if I was just to read the entrepreneurship literature, I don't, I don't think I'd get as excited to come up with, with interesting things. It's the intersection of entrepreneurship and other areas that tends to, uh, to excite me the most. Um, don't focus too much on the outlet, the research outlet. Um, focus on the research question and then kind of figure out where is the best place uh, to publish that that fits. A lot of people just instantly drop a research project if it doesn't get into AMJ or something, even though it may be very interesting. Sometimes it may be too interesting, it may be too novel, and it may have imperfections that are associated with that. The more you do something interesting and, and push the limits, the more difficult it's going to be to be as rigorous as you need to be to get in a top journal sometimes. Don't just chase grants. A lot of people chase grants. Especially if it's a novel topic, it might be easy to write a grant on. But you have to ask your, yourself the question of whether it's really worth it and you're spending too much time just satisfying the grant rather than actually doing research and getting other things done. And the last one is something a lot of people suffer with early in their careers is perfectionist paralysis where you think everything needs to be perfect. You need to make sure you're making progress and getting feedback, but keep going. Uh, nothing's perfect, right? There's, there's no perfect paper. I mean, you go through any of the top journals and there's flaws in all of those papers too. It's not perfect, but just keep going and trying to make progress forward. So my last thought here, this is off of, uh, this is a deviation from a saying I often like to say to my students that only boring people get bored. It makes a lot of sense, right? So similarly, I think only boring people do boring research, right? If you get out there, you do interesting things, you're going to run into interesting questions. It's easy to just sit in your cubicle at school and just focus on reading the articles in front of you and not doing like Shacker said and actually get out there and talk to people. Um, go to interesting places, do interesting things, come up with interesting ideas and, allow, and collect interesting data, perhaps most importantly even. So that's all I have to say. So uh, Shaker and I, I guess, will uh, take questions now.